hypothalamic centers they have high density of uh, receptors for the neurotransmitters and uh, hormones and uh, hunger center operates by exciting the motor drives to search for food now the uh, lateral nuclei of uh, hypothalamus they serve as a feeding center so stimulation of this area causes the person to eat voraciously and uh, that condition is named hyperphagia for same reason destruction of lateral hypothalamus causes lack of desire for food what about the other nuclei uh you see the lesions of uh, paraventricular nuclei often cause excessive eating while that of the dorsomedial nuclei usually depress eating behavior arcuate nuclei receive uh, signals by certain hormones of git and adipose tissue to regulate the food intake here i wouldn't skip the mention of uh, satiety it is the state of being fed to or beyond capacity a satiety center is located in the ventromedial nucleus of hypothalamus and it inhibits the appetite even in the presence of food also the arcuate nucleus has uh, various neurons which uh, project onto the satiety center there are uh, two important mechanisms involved in uh, food ingestion mastication and uh, swallowing so let's start about the detail of each one by one the process in which food is cut and ground into small pieces with help of teeth is called mastication and it is caused by chewing reflex it is the first step in digestive process the number of chews that are optimal uh, depend on the food that usually ranges from 20 to 25 uh, since the edentulous patients they are restricted to soft diet so they have considerable difficulty in eating dry food so it means that uh, both anterior and posterior teeth are uh, admirably designed for chewing the incisors provide the cutting action and uh, the molars they provide grinding action and uh, now the jaw muscles they control the movement of uh, teeth and would you believe that all the jaw muscles working together they can close the teeth with a force as great as uh, um, 55 pounds on incisors and 200 pounds on molars muscles of mastication are striated and uh, under voluntary control but uh, the chewing process is mostly reflex the muscles are innervated by mandibular branch of trigeminal nerve while chewing process is controlled by centers present in brain stem stimulation of specific reticular areas in brain stem also cause rhythmical chewing movements higher nervous control on chewing is exerted by hypothalamus amygdala and uh, cerebral cortex area near the sensory areas for taste and smell now uh, here is the flow chart for chewing reflex and it describes the whole mechanism of uh, chewing and it is a university questions also so please memorize this uh, flow chart as such few 
lazy ones of you must be thinking that uh, why do we need to chew the food at all so i am asking them to write down the functions of this process uh, so what are the functions uh, it breaks indigestible cellulose coats of fruits and vegetables then uh, it increases the surface area for the action of digestive enzymes chewing mixes the food with saliva and makes swallowing easier properly chewed food prevents excoriation of uh, gastrointestinal tract and increases the ease with which food is emptied into small intestine from stomach and don't forget that it also helps to stimulate the taste buds after mastication the next step is the formation of a bolus uh and uh, this formation is the combined function of mouth and teeth while chewing food is moved around the mouth by tongue and muscles of cheeks and then it is mixed with saliva and formed into a soft mass of bolus ready for swallowing now the length of time that food remains in mouth depend on the consistency of food let me show you the complicated mechanism of swallowing which occurs after the chewing is complete and the bolus has been formed our pharynx plays an important role in swallowing it uh, subserves both respiration and swallowing because it is converted into a tract for propulsion of food for only a few seconds at a time and it is especially important that respiration not be compromised because of swallowing swallowing can be divided into three stages only the first stage uh, which initiates the swallowing process is voluntary uh, so the next two of course they are involuntary and among the involuntary ones uh, pharyngeal stage passes the food through the pharynx into the esophagus and uh, the esophageal one transport food from there to stomach so what happens in uh, the voluntary stage of swallowing it is initiated when the bolus of food or liquid food is voluntarily propelled to the back of the mouth by tongue for which the movement of the tongue is upward and backward against the palate interestingly swallowing is initiated voluntarily but once begun it cannot be stopped the pharyngeal stage um consists of a series of uh, automatic pharyngeal muscle contractions in fact uh, it's a reflex act which was initiated by the voluntary movement bolus of the food in posterior part of the mouth and pharynx stimulate the epithelial swallowing receptors which lie uh, in the most sensitive tactile area uh, that is uh, in a ring around the pharyngeal opening uh, although the greatest sensitivity of these receptors is uh, on the tonsillar pillars so uh, now which nerve fibers regulate the initiation of the pharyngeal stage uh, this could be your viva question you see from the receptors afferent signals they pass through sensory portions of trigeminal and glossopharyngeal nerve to the nucleus of uh, tractor solitarius and the nucleus ambiguus from these control centers afferent signals pass through trigeminal glossopharyngeal vagus and hypoglossal nerves to the pharyngeal muscles 
Now, uh, who governs the rest of the process? Actually, the successive stages of the swallowing, they are initiated uh, automatically. But uh, neuronal areas of the reticular substance in medulla and the lower portion of pons initiate orderly sequence of uh, these successive stages. And these uh, areas collectively, they are called uh, deglutition center. Usually, a sequence of uh, swallowing reflex swallowing reflex it remains same from one swallow to the other and the timing of the entire cycle also remains constant from one swallow to next this uh, pharyngeal stage it lasts for less than one to two seconds and it is initiated when a soft palate is pulled upward, closing posterior nares. And uh, this action, it prevents the entry of food into nose. Next, the platypharyngeal folds, they approximate medially forming a slit and allow the masticated food to pass. The third step uh, consists of uh, certain movements. Uh, such as um, the vocal cords, they are strongly pulled together. Larynx is uh, pulled upward and anteriorly by the neck muscles. So these are actions combined with the presence of uh, ligaments that prevent upward movement of the glottis, they cause the epiglottis to swing backward over the opening of larynx. So all these movements, they prevent the entry of food into larynx. Here, I repeat again that the actions which prevent choking are a tight approximation of the vocal cords. Now, this is the most essential. And other than that, uh, the action which prevent choking, that is the movement of epiglottis. So, destruction of vocal cords or uh, of the muscles that approximate them, it can cause uh, choking or the strangulation. Now the movements take place in the next step are the upward movement of larynx along with esophagus to enlarge the opening of esophagus and simultaneous relaxation of upper esophageal sphincter occurs. This sphincter is called a pharyngeal esophageal sphincter also and it is formed by upper 3 to 4 centimeters of the esophageal muscle wall. As a result of these uh, movements food moves easily and freely from uh, the posterior pharynx into the upper esophagus. Keep in mind that uh, uh, during this fourth step, the sphincter remains strongly contracted between the swallows and hence prevents the air going into esophagus during respiration. Now this step provides extra protection against uh, respiration. How? Because the upward movement of larynx also lifts the glottis out of mainstream of the uh, food flow. So the advantage is of food passing on the each side of the epiglottis not over its surface. Once the uh, larynx is uh, raised and the pharyngeal sphincter is relaxed, the entire muscular wall of the pharynx contracts in next step. This contraction begins in superior part of pharynx. Along with contraction, a wave of peristalsis also begins, spreading in middle and inferior pharyngeal areas. As a result, the food is propelled in esophagus. Now here is uh, another viva question. Does the pharyngeal stage affect respiration? Yes. 
Respiration is halted during the pharyngeal stage of swallowing and it is called pharyngeal apnea. It occurs for only a short time that it is barely noticeable like a fraction of a usual respiratory cycle. It occurs even when the person is talking and swallowing. And the nervous control of this pharyngeal apnea is achieved through inhibition of respiratory center in medulla by the swallowing center. Let's look into the second involuntary stage of swallowing, uh, which is the esophageal stage. The function of uh, the esophageal stage is the rapid conduction of food from uh, pharynx or esophagus to stomach. And during this stage, uh, esophagus exhibits two types of uh, peristaltic movements, primary and secondary. This uh, primary, uh, primary peristalsis is a continuation of the peristaltic wave beginning in the pharynx. Swallowing center initiates this wave of peristalsis from beginning to end of the esophagus. This wave uh, progress as a ring-like contraction of smooth muscle fibers that push the bolus into the relaxed area ahead of contraction. It takes about 8 to 10 seconds to reach the lower end of esophagus. In uh, upright position, food is uh, uh, transmitted to the lower end of the esophagus even more rapidly than the peristaltic wave itself, like in an, about uh, 5 to 8 seconds. And uh, what's the reason? Yes, the effect of gravity. Scantary peristaltic wave initiates if uh, the primary a uh, peristaltic wave fails to carry the bolus of the food to esophagus and it is mediated by the distension of esophagus by the retained food or by the intrinsic nerve plexus like the myenteric one or the secondary wave could be a reflex movement beginning in the pharynx for which the afferent are vagal fibers while efferent are glossopharyngeal and vagal fibers. What happens in the secondary peristaltic wave is that uh, it begins at the level of distension and these waves uh, continue until all the food has been emptied into the stomach. In addition to that, distension of the esophagus also stimulates slivery secretion. You should also know the nervous control of uh, esophageal stage. Since the musculature of pharyngeal wall and upper one third of esophagus is striated, so it is controlled by skeletal nerve impulses from glossopharyngeal and vagus. However, in uh, a lower two third, the musculature is smooth and it is controlled by vagus through esophageal myenteric system. What do you expect uh, would happen if the nervous control is lost? You see the esophageal peristalsis is so effective that the entire meal can be swallowed while uh, one is uh, even upside down. So when the vagus to the esophagus is cut, after several days, myenteric nerve plexus becomes excitable enough to cause secondary peristaltic wave even without support from the vagal reflex. Or even in case of uh, paralysis of swallowing reflex, the tube-fed food still passes to stomach. Here, uh, don't forget an important structure which is uh, lower esophageal or you can say gastroesophageal sphincter. It's a broad sphincter made up of a circular muscle located at the lower end of esophagus, but it also extends upward about 3 cm above its junction with stomach. This sphincter normally remains tonically constricted and uh, intraluminal 
pressure at this point in the esophagus is about uh, 30 millimeter of mercury while the mid portion of the esophagus that remains relaxed the presence of uh, this uh, lower esophageal sphincter it has uh, certain advantages because the tonic constriction of uh, this sphincter it's a protective feature why because it helps to prevent the reflux of gastric contents back into the esophagus. Now, why do you think this prevention is necessary? Because, my dear, uh, stomach secretions, they are not only highly acidic, but they also contain proteolytic enzymes. And uh, esophageal mucosa, it cannot resist digestive action of gastric secretion for long. Here is uh, another thing which gives uh, extra prevention against uh, esophageal reflux. You see the valve-like closure of uh, the distal end of esophagus provides additional protective mechanism. Uh, what happens that a short portion of esophagus extends slightly into the stomach but increased intra-abdominal pressure caves this portion inward. So it results in a wave-like closure of lower esophagus. Now, uh, with all this production, this is very amazing, but uh, how does the food bolus move on? Actually, when the food reaches the lower end of the esophagus, there is a receptive relaxation of uh, the lower esophageal sphincter so that the food passes from the esophagus to the stomach. This wave of relaxation precedes the peristalsis and it is transmitted through myenteric inhibitory neurons. Surprisingly, the relaxation it may extend up to entire stomach or even duodenum. And uh, these parts of the alimentary tract they are prepared ahead of time to receive the food. So you see that easy propulsion of uh, swallowed food is uh, not the only advantage of receptive relaxation. Now let me show you the disorders of uh, swallowing and their etiologies. There could be a paralysis of a swallowing mechanism and uh, its causes include uh, uh, damage to the 5th, 9th or 10th cranial nerve. Um, it also includes the damage to the swallowing center such as in case of uh, poliomyelitis or encephalitis. Then uh, the paralysis of uh, swallowing muscles such as in uh, muscle dystrophy or in failure of neuromuscular transmission such as in myasthenia gravis and uh, then also don't forget the deep anesthesia as one of the causes. Other abnormalities that uh, may occur, uh, these include the abrogation of the swallowing act and uh, passage of the food into trachea or into nose. Then uh, there is uh, dysphagia which means difficulty in swallowing and this difficulty can be to liquids or solids or both. Next is the painful swallowing which is known as uh, odinophagia. An examiner may ask you the cause of uh, dysphagia or odinophagia so here is a long list of all these causes you can memorize it now this disorder is an interesting one you see, some air is uh, unavoidably swallowed in the process of eating and drinking. 
However, swallowing of large amounts of air is known as aerophagia. And this condition is psychogenic in nature and uh, it causes abdominal distension and discomfort. Here is the condition which is a short, short university question. It is uh, an uh, esophageal motility disorder in which the lower esophageal sphincter becomes hypertonic. Now this condition is characterized by failure of a lower esophageal sphincter to relax during swallowing or the absence of peristalsis in lower two-thirds of esophagus or both the factors damage to the myenteric plexus in lower two-third of uh, esophagus is the likely cause so what happens in ecclesia over the months and years esophagus becomes tremendously enlarged and it can hold even one liter of food which becomes uh, putridly infected during long periods of stasis Gradually, there is a ulceration of esophageal mucosa, which leads to substernal pain. Frighteningly, rupture of the esophagus and death can also occur. If you want to diagnose ecclesia, you focus on its signs and symptoms, like uh, patient may have difficulty in swallowing, regurgitation of food, and the retrosternal pain but the diagnosis is uh, confirmed by barium swallow and esophageal uh, manometry here you can see a barium swallow uh, showing typical features of aclasia which are uh, uh, mega esophagus and the constricted lower esophageal sphincter Now, <clears throat> ecclesia is treated with the, the balloon dilatation and the anti-spasmodic drugs. And uh, this figure gives you a simplified version of the balloon dilatation. I'm sure you didn't imagine what an intricate uh, process swallowing is, where so many things can go wrong among which a relatively common one is reflux esophagitis. It is the abnormal reflux of gastric contents into lower end of esophagus and commonly seen in smokers and obese persons. Patient has a typical history of uh, retrosternal burning and pain which increases on leaning forward and uh, on lying flat. There can be regurgitation of stomach contents into mouth even and unfortunately in later stages these strictures they are formed due to scarring its uh, treatment includes uh, inhibition of uh, acid secretion or fundoplication although these symptoms they are temporarily relieved by antacids also now students uh, is it enough for today you see the food is already in stomach so next time we will see what happens with it in there today uh, before starting with the stomach i will tell you general digestive phases actually stomach and duodenal function can be divided into three discrete phases which are uh, cephalic gastric and intestinal phases these phases allow for preparation timing and regulation feedback for example a uh, cephalic phase is uh, primarily feed forward regulation while uh, gastric and intestinal phases are feedback mechanisms a cephalic phase is uh, triggered by the thought of food or the conditions suggestive of previous food intake for example the classical conditioning to eat after hearing a dinner bell chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors in the oral 
nasal cavities and uh, throat they are stimulated by tasting chewing swallowing and smelling food to phallic phase is uh, primarily neural and it uh, causes acetylcholine and uh, uh, vip release which stimulate the excretion by salivary glands stomach pancreas and intestine gastric phase uh, begins when food and uh, oral secretions enter the stomach it coincides with the distension and uh, uh, stomach contents such as amino uh, acid and peptides and elicits uh, neural hormonal and paracrine gi response such example of combination of the signaling molecules is uh, uh, gastric acid secretion as you can see here intestinal phase uh, begins when stomach contents enter the duodenum it is linked to digested uh, constituents of protein and fats as well as uh, hydrogen ion it initiates primarily hormonal but also paracrine and neural response a uh, secretion released during this phase are shown here since uh, feeding tubes are used to provide nutritional support in uh, certain conditions like uh, patients with uh, swallowing disorders or patients on mechanical ventilation uh the examples of uh, such feeding tubes are uh, nasogastric nasoduodenal and uh, peg tube these uh, deliver the nutrients past the obstructed areas thereby bypass majority of the digestive phase in his initiation cues so this requires the feeding tube formula to be prepared in a manner that will not require upper gi processing of food uh now uh, nutrients infused intravenously bypass the entire gi system so care must be taken to include all the required nutrients plus less kilo calories are necessary as 7% of the energy consumed by mouth is used to digest and absorb nutrients now uh, let's start with the physiologic anatomy of uh, stomach stomach uh, is a, a j shaped sac like structure and it is divided into three parts fundus body and antrum the uh, terminal portion is a pyloric sphincter which is a barrier between stomach and duodenum physiologically stomach is divided into orad and caudad parts three important uh, motor functions are performed by stomach storage of food mixing and uh, propulsion of food and uh, slow emptying of uh, uh, gastric contents which are now called chyme into the duodenum food is uh, stored until it can be processed in stomach duodenum and lower intestine uh let's look at the filling of the stomach now as the food enters the stomach it forms concentric circles of food in orad portion of the stomach in these layers the newest food that lies closest to the esophageal opening and the oldest food towards outer wall of the stomach when stomach is empty its walls are in apposition and the volume of empty stomach is only 50 ml while during a meal it can expand to 1.5 liter how because uh, stomach relaxes with each mouthful by the flattening of rugal folds keep in mind that fundus usually does not store food but it contains gas and then there is a, a vago vagal reflex which uh, helps in the filling of stomach 
it extends from stomach to brain stem and then back to stomach due to this reflex stomach can accommodate 24 change in the volume with little change in intragastric pressure but if more than 1.5 liter of food is consumed then stomach over distends and uh, the intragastric pressure increases and the person experiences discomfort actually uh, when food stretches the stomach there is a reflex reduction in the tone of stomach's muscular wall wall of the body portion of the stomach bulges progressively outward and stomach can accommodate greater and greater quantities of food up to a limit and that limit is around uh, uh, 0 0.8 to 1.5 liter uh, and pressure in the stomach it remains low until this limit is approached next task is uh, uh, mixing and uh, propulsion of food in the stomach but why this mixing is required because the uh, digestive juices which are secreted by gastric glands must be mixed with food to form semi-fluid chyme gastric glands are present in almost entire wall of uh, the body of stomach except along the lesser curvature Nascretions come immediately into contact with portion of stored food lying against the mucosal surface, but mixing requires movement. So it means that uh, mixing is achieved through stomach motility. Muscle layer in uh, the body and the fundus, they are thin. So the mixing movements here are feeble. Uh, so mixing of the food mainly occurs in antrum. Uh, in stomach, mixing and propulsion, they go hand in hand. And uh, now we are going to see how it is achieved. As long as the food remains in stomach, weak uh, peristaltic constrictor waves, they begin in the mid to the upper portion of the stomach. These waves are called mixing waves also. They appear once every 15 to 20 seconds and move toward antrum and their frequency is around 2 to 3 per minute. So how the uh, constrictor waves are initiated? Uh, actually by the basic electrical rhythm of uh, gut wall. This rhythm consists of spontaneous slow waves in stomach. These waves uh, progress from uh, body to the antrum of the stomach while moving toward antrum they, they become so powerful that they start peristaltic waves like constrictor rings. The thorough mixing is achieved by uh, constrictor waves and retropulsion. How? Each time a constrictor wave passes down the antral wall, it digs deeply into the food contents. And digestive secretion is brought in contact with the newer portions of food. Now, retropulsion. When uh, peristaltic constrictor ring reaches pylorus, the pyloric muscle often contracts. The contraction brings about two effects. It impedes the emptying of contents through the pylorus and the antral contents they are squeezed upstream resulting in further mixing and that's called retropulsion now uh, do you need me to uh, walk you through the mixing function of the stomach again uh, you see in this uh, figure that uh, when the peristaltic contraction reaches the pyloric sphincter, the sphincter is tightly closed and no further emptying takes place. 
when kaim that was being propelled uh, towards uh, forward it hits the uh, close sphincter it is tossed back into the antrum mixing of kaim is accomplished as uh, the kaim is propelled forward and uh, tossed back into the antrum with each peristaltic contraction now uh moving on to propulsion in stomach as the constrictor waves move toward antrum they become strong and intense and they push the food toward pylorus under high pressure with each wave only a uh, few milliliters or less of the enter contents they are expelled in the duodenum because the opening of the pylorus is very small when it is closed uh i mentioned that word earlier but do you know what uh what's kind it is the uh, resulting mixture when uh, once food is in the stomach it has become thoroughly mixed with the gastric secretions so in appearance kind is uh, uh murky semi fluid or paste like but the degree of the fluidity that depend upon the relative amount of food water and the stomach secretions and uh, also the degree of digestion took place in the stomach oh that sounds familiar so the hunger contractions are intense contractions that occur when the stomach has been empty for several hours they are rhythmical peristaltic contractions in the body of stomach interestingly uh, these are most intense in young healthy people who have high degree of uh, gi tone and uh, these contractions are also increased by the persons uh, having lower than normal blood sugar level you might have used the word hunger pains but uh, do you know what it actually means during prolonged fasting after 12 to 24 hours the contractions are associated with the feeling of pain in the pit of stomach and that is hunger pain successive contractions become strong and they often fuse to cause tetanic contractions that last for about 2 to 3 minutes hunger pains reach maximum intensity during 3 to 4 days and uh, then uh, gradually they weaken in the succeeding days now this is an important topic emptying the stomach occurs at uh, such a slow rate which is suitable for proper digestion and absorption by the small intestine this emptying is promoted by intense peristaltic contractions in stomach antrum and it is opposed by the emptying is opposed by varying degree of uh, resistance to the passage of chyme at pylorus in other words the emptying that depend upon the activity of uh, pyloric pump and the tone of pyloric sphincter first you should know what is pyloric pump it is the powerful peristaltic action of stomach which is achieved through tight ring like constrictions in the mid stomach spreading to the antrum and these are six times more powerful than the usual mixing waves of stomach and pressure created by these contractions is around 50 to 70 cm of water 80% of the time uh, rhythmical contractions in stomach are weak and they mainly cause mixing but 20% of the time the rhythmical contractions they become intense and a tight ring like contraction appears as they move to the caudal stomach and these cause the stomach emptying 
as uh, stomach becomes more and more empty these contractions begin farther in the upper part and they pinch of food in the body of the stomach and add it to the chyme in antrum this uh, pump action forces several uh, milliliters of chyme into the duodenum every time the wave arises keep in mind that normal tone of the circular muscle of the antrum that is required to augment the pressure of these waves a uh, pylorus uh, as you know is the distal opening of the stomach and the pyloric sphincter is the thickened circular muscle of the stomach wall in the area of pylorus this thickness is uh, 50 to 100% greater than in the earlier portions of the stomach antra pyloric sphincter normally remains tonically constricted but despite the tonic constriction pylorus is slightly open now the degree of constriction it can be increased or decreased by nervous or hormonal factors because of the slight opening water and other fluids they can empty from stomach to duodenum with ease however it prevents the passage of food particles until these have been mixed with gastric secretions to form fluid kind let me now uh, summarize it again for you a, a peristaltic contraction originates in the upper fundus and sweeps down toward the pyloric sphincter the contraction becomes more vigorous as it uh, reaches the thick muscled antrum the uh, strong antral peristaltic contraction propels the chyme forward a small portion of chyme is uh, pushed through the partially open sphincter into the duodenum the stronger the antral contraction the more chyme is emptied with each contractile wave now this emptying of stomach must be regulated at an um, optimal rate and this rate uh, should not be greater than the rate at which the chyme can be digested and absorbed in small intestine the rate is uh, regulated by certain factors which you can see on uh, the screen mm. and here are the gastric factors which have a uh, moderate effect in uh, regulating the emptying increased uh, food volume in the stomach it means increased emptying from the stomach but why not due to the increased storage pressure in uh, usual normal range of volume the increase in the volume it doesn't increase the pressure actually the increase in volume it stretches the stomach wall so the local myenteric reflex is elicited in the stomach wall and the activity of pyloric pump is greatly accentuated uh now you already know that uh, uh gastrin is released from g cells of the enteral mucosa and it promotes uh, it promotes gastric emptying but how does it do it you see it enhances the activity of pyloric pump and also it has mild to moderate stimulatory effect on the motor activity of stomach body and then it causes the secretion of acid from stomach glands which results in accelerated digestion and rapid preparation for emptying as far as the uh, food type is concerned uh, the carbohydrate rich food empties in few hours while the protein rich food empties more slowly and the slowest emptying is after taking fat rich diet
duodenal factors are more powerful than the gastric factors since uh, they are inhibitory in nature so they can slow or even stop the stomach emptying Neural factors are uh, multiple nervous reflexes which are initiated when food enters the duodenum and uh, they are called enterogastric reflexes as they pass back to the stomach. Uh, these are strongly activated within uh, 30 seconds and they exert their uh, inhibitory effect by strongly inhibiting the pyloric pump propulsive contractions and by increasing the tone of pyloric sphincter. So, which uh, uh, routes are taken by these neural factors? You see, they, they course directly from duodenum to stomach through the enteric system of the gut wall or through the extin extrinsic nerves which go to, go to the prevertebral sympathetic ganglia and travel back through inhibitory sympathetic nerve fibers to stomach. Uh, also through uh, the vagus nerve to the brain stem, they inhibit the normal excitatory signals to the stomach. There are uh, various uh, stimuli that can initiate the enterogastric uh, reflexes. Uh, here, uh, acidity, it also acts as uh, irritant. In fact, the pH of the chyme below 3.5 or 4, it blocks the entry of uh, stomach contents till the chyme is neutralized. The osmolarity of chyme uh, means the flow of the non-isotonic fluids, uh, both the hypo or the hypertonic, at rapid rate in the duodenum. And that's how the rapid change in the electrolyte concentration by uh, uh, concentration of the ECF by the intestinal absorption that is prevented. And uh, finally, the breakdown products of proteins and fats, they ensured the uh, sufficient time for their adequate digestion in uh, the duodenum. If we look at the hormonal factors, uh, effector hormones uh, are released from uh, upper intestine as the receptors are found for ligand binding on the duodenal and the jejunal epithelial cells. And stimulus for the hormonal release is mainly fats entering the duodenum. As you already know, fat is much slower to be digested. But to lesser extent, the release is also stimulated by the entry of other foods. The hormonal inhibition uh, works by inhibiting the pyloric pump and increasing the uh, strength of uh, contraction of pyloric sphincter. Now among hormones which are released, uh, CCK is the most potent which is released in response to uh, excess of ac acidic or fatty chyme. Factors outside uh, GIT affecting the gastric mortality, these are uh, sadness and uh, fear which causes decreased motility uh, and then there is anger and uh, aggression which leads to increased motility while pain uh, causes decreased motility due to increased sympathetic activity well uh, here is the summary of uh, the factors affecting uh, gastric emptying and uh, I think you should memorize it for the sake of your exam.
before uh, moving on to the uh, disorders of gastric motility uh, you must have a look at the functions of uh, stomach because sometimes exam questions they could be pretty simple also let's now start the disorders with uh, gastritis which is uh, inflammation of gastric mucosa it may be superficial deep acute chronic or mild the superficial gastritis is uh, not very harmful but uh, the deep one it penetrates the gastric mucosa acute gastritis could be severe to cause ulcerative excoriation of the stomach mucosa by stomach's own peptic secretions and in many long standing cases a complete atrophy of the gastric mucosa can also occur while the moderate chronic gastritis is common in uh, especially in uh, uh, middle to later years of life its causes uh, uh, include chronic bacterial infection or the ingested irritants like uh, alcohol or aspirin once the gastric mucosal barrier is damaged uh, the gastric acid it diffuses into the epithelium and it causes further damage and atrophy of the gastric mucosa and uh, complications of the chronic gastritis uh, they include uh, loss of gastric uh, secretions so achlorhydria and also uh, pernicious anemia next disorder is uh, uh, peptic ulcer uh, which is an excoriated area of uh, the gastric or the intestinal mucosa caused by the digestive action of gastric juices or upper small intestinal secretions common sites for an ulcer to develop they are uh, pylorus duodenum lesser curvature of the enteral end of uh, the stomach and also the lower end of esophagus well an uh, imbalance between the rate of gastric juice secretion and the protection provided that is considered uh, as an underlying mechanism and uh, uh, you see the 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 usual protection is offered by the gastrodudinal mucosal barrier and the neutralization of the gastric acid by the duodenal juices so uh, here is the list of uh, the causes for the development of uh, peptic ulcer and uh, here are the predisposing factors um so no wonder the smokers alcoholics and uh, type a personalities they are they are more prone to develop uh, a peptic ulcer well coming toward the symptoms the pain in the epigastrium that is the typical symptom uh, of this peptic ulcer in case of duodenal ulcers the pain is relieved by food and antacids while in case of the gastric ulcer the relation of pain to meal and the timing that is uh, variable and it can be aggravated by taking meal and uh, then on examination tenderness is present in the epigastrium uh you must know that a peptic ulcer should not be left untreated because in uh, extreme cases uh, it could turn into a nightmare when the ulcer complicates to perforation and hemorrhage 
So the treatment that includes the administration of uh, antibiotics because the uh, bacterial infectious basis of the disease and in addition an acid suppressing drug especially the ranitidine that is prescribed since uh, this ranitidine it's an antihistaminic agent it blocks the stimulatory effect of histamine on the gastric glands H2 receptors and so it results in 70 to 80% reduction in the acid secretion.